Well, everyone, welcome back to Bible study, journeying through the book of James. Um, and I pray you're enjoying it so far. Uh, I think it's one of the one of the best letters in the New Testament, one of the most challenging letters in the New Testament, because uh, it's written to believers like you and I. And I think there's just so much in it. It's so rich. It's so full. And I appreciate it. And, and I love digging into it. So I hope you are enjoying it and we are in the midst of chapter 3. Uh, we've journeyed through uh, to verse 12 of chapter 3. And so tonight we will pick, off, pick up kind of where we left off. And it kind of now is going to move into a discussion of, of wisdom. And as we begin, I think we need to be crystal clear how James moves from his earlier discussion really about self-control over what? our tongue. Now he moves us to this discussion of wisdom, and that transition, uh, it's really quite simple. We got to first remember that James is a letter about showing our faith through works in the face of tests and trials. And remember that James 3 begins with uh, this discussion about gaining control over ungodly speech. And so with that being said, we are now going to pick up at verse number 13. So you got your Bibles, your notepads, your pens. I'm drinking some cold brew over ice. Not doing hot coffee, but doing some cold coffee. Uh, and let's go and let's, let's just read James chapter 13. It says, Who among you is wise and understanding by his good conduct? Let him show his deeds in the gentleness of wisdom. So James moves his focus now to those in the church who, who try to show their wisdom and their spiritual maturity simply with, hey, I'll say all the right things. I'm going to impress people with my words. Really talking the talk like we have in a lot of churches today, but not really walking the walk. Demonstrating wisdom through this kind of impressive oratory. That was the common style for, for both Greek and Jewish wise men. They really equated wisdom with the ability to pontificate on these weighty matters for hours and hours. And just talk, 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 and talk. Um, and to really, they learned how to engage in rhetorical arguments and learned how to debate with great skill, or they learned how to twist the meaning of words and then turn them into their advantage. That doesn't happen in the church at all today, right? So James, he asks the church, who among you is wise and understanding? If you go back and remember how James began chapter 3, he said, shouldn't we press ourselves we, we shouldn't really press ourselves into that teaching role because we risk harsher judgment. If, if our tongue convicts us in the course of leading and teaching wrongly, falsely, a teacher's role is ultimately one of conveying godly wisdom through words and then backing up those words through godly living. <laughs> Not just talking the talk, but walking the walk. And we got to be able to live up to both standards and what we say must be godly, and how we live out, it's got to equally be godly. So the Greek word for wise and understanding are important to understand, uh, to, to really understand what James is getting at here. And the word for wise means to have moral insight or to discern issues of moral conduct, really to know right from wrong and to make judgments about what God considers proper. Understanding means having an expertise in something, being like an intellectual. So if we were to kind of reword the opening of verse 13, James is asking, you think you can be a teacher or leader and speak for God, says concerning right, for what God says concerning right and wrong. You you think you're an expert in righteousness and godliness, question mark. And then to this question, James provides the challenge. James says, then show your wisdom, 
right? Show me your wisdom and understanding through your good behavior in deeds done in humility. Did you see the two parts to James' command? Did you see it? Did you grasp it when you read it? First, you don't practice wisdom in understanding through words alone. It's not just with speech. You can't just talk the talk. You have to walk the walk. It's the same theme here again. Wisdom, like faith, isn't a concept. It's a way of life that actually requires action. And the Jewish Christians, they were still trapped in this uh, pharisaical pattern of giving others the lectures on holiness, but not willing to practice it themselves, right? They didn't want to do it. And if you go to Matthew chapter 23 and read verses 1 to 3, you could just write it down. I'll read it for you. It says, Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees, they have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Therefore, all that they tell you, do and observe, but don't, do not do according to their deeds. For they say things, and they don't do them. Think about that, how harsh that is, that if Jesus was to look at your life, hey, do what they say, but not what they do, because they don't even listen to what they say. So James says talking about matters of righteousness and godliness isn't the same as being godly or righteous. And if we think we're wise in these matters, but we we can't bring ourselves to actually live righteously in good deeds and behaviors, then really the only people we're fooling is ourselves, just like the Pharisees did. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be labeled a Pharisee. And then secondly, James' commandment requires that we perform these deeds really in gentleness of wisdom. And the term in Greek means humility with a sense of submitting to God, who is the source of all godly wisdom. Here again, true godly wisdom lived out is never prideful, it's never arrogant, it's not self-serving, it's not rude, it's not critical, it is gentle, it's loving, it's humble, it's reflecting the fact that our godlessness was not a product of our, our, our ourselves. We didn't figure anything out or create anything ourselves. We arrived at our station in life by the grace of God. We are saved by God's grace, and we are sanctified by his grace. And in obedience, what happens? We submit to his spirit, and we demonstrate wisdom through submission to his will, to abiding in Christ and walking that out and doing what he's asking us to do. This opening verse really sets the positive example for wisdom Uh, And James uses really the rest of chapter 3 to explore the opposite problem. So let's read verses 14 to 18. That will bring us to the end of chapter 3. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast and lie against the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there is disorder in every evil practice. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial, not hypocritical. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in shalom by those who make shalom. So, apparently... Right, we can get from this. Apparently, some leadership in the early Jewish church had been seeking for teaching or leadership positions out of a place of selfish ambition. What am I going to get from this? And of course, right, that never happens in the church today. We we never kind of want to promote ourselves to that place where maybe we might have some things to gain. And when people when people seek for leadership. Or, or teaching positions really out of a place of selfish ambition, um, they actually become competitors in, in a race for recognition where what Jesus offers them is not enough and who they are in Christ is not enough. 
that there's this race to be recognized and say, hey, look at me. And usually what happens, this leads to bitter jealousies and uh, allegiances of various kinds of evil. And James actually alludes to exactly this kind of uh, disunity. And he says in verse 14, they're acting and speaking arrogantly. They're lying against the truth. And, and arrogance is the, is the result really of selfish ambition and jealousies. That's where, where arrogance is going to lead you all the time. It, that's that's what it is right there. We can easily imagine various men and perhaps even women seeking positions in church leadership. And if we look at biblical leadership, it always includes expectation that leaders are also teachers of God's word. You can read that in Titus. You can read that in 1 Timothy. So these ambitious people, they, they begin to compete with one another for who was the most wise in the knowledge of Scripture? What happens? They engage in rhetorical debates, probably concerning the law, prophecies, concerning Jesus, right? They didn't have any New Testament Scripture yet. Then as one, as one might gain an advantage over another, what happens? Well, now there's jealousy and bitter jealousy is developed and men harbored anger and hatred towards another. In factions and camps resulted one against another, supporting their own leadership candidate or their own teacher. And what James is saying is this resulted in disorder within the body and led to every evil thing. And really the source for this degeneration within the church began with ungodly speech, driven by what? Selfish ambition and arrogance. And it leads eventually to uh, like the disintegration of the body when you look at it. And James points out that this kind of wisdom, it's definitely not from above. And he uses the word wisdom in an ironic sense because clearly it's not wise thinking. It's kind of thinking, uh, it's a kind of thinking that's demonic and, and really based in a demonic source. James isn't suggesting that we are supposed to blame Satan directly for those or for all of these believers. It's, it's, it's not, hey, the devil made me do it. We can never say that. But this kind of discord and evil traces back to the sin uh, of Satan in the throne room and flows through the sin of Adam in the garden to you and I today. We're acting a way in, that finds its origins in Satan's pride, in pride. So when we say we want to serve God through a teaching role and then seek the role out of selfish ambition and arrogance, we, we're actually not acting in a godly way. We're actually acting in a very satanic way, uh, in a way that we are acting in sin, and we lie against the truth. And James says the truth here, which refers to the gospel itself, and so how do we lie against the gospel when we begin to act this way? Well, it's because we may be speaking the truth of the gospel with our mouths, but by our sinful arrogance and our selfish, selfishness or selfish ambition, what happens? We tear down the gospel by our actions. We're talking the talk, but we're definitely not walking the walk. And unbelievers who watch us they're not, they're not idiots. They're not stupid, right? They hear our words, and then what they do? They watch our sinful actions, and then they make the obvious conclusion. They fail to believe our message because our actions declare it to be a lie. Hey, listen, you're saying all this stuff, but man, I see the way you live. I see the way you act. I see the things you do, and it doesn't match up what you're saying. So James says that true godly wisdom comes from above, and yields a different set of behaviors. And what are they? Well, first, it's pure, right? It's uncontaminated by fleshly, sinful desires and ambitions. It's pure. And if we feel a call, if you feel a call to teach God's people and to lead in that capacity, we can know it's a godly calling by testing our ambitions. 
are we as excited to teach a class as of three as if it was a class of 300? I remember one of the things that I, I, I did when, when I got into teaching and preaching is I would learn and I would practice to an empty church. And so I would get up and, and I would preach like the church was full. I, I would do it. And I actually still do it every Thursday. I, I get up on Thursday and after our morning devotion here at the church, I get up and I completely preach my message uh, with, with everything I got, with everything I got. Because I, I, I learned if I can learn how to preach to an empty room, I'm never going to be influenced by numbers. So whether there's one, a hundred, a thousand, ten thousand, then I'm going to give it. I'm going to give it the same. I'm not going to be influenced by the crowd. So do we feel jealousy when another teacher finds something in Scripture that we didn't find ourselves? Oh, I never saw that. And, and we begin to get mad and bitter. Are, are we tempted to claim another teaching, another teacher's content as our own? Now, here's the beautiful thing. Like, there's nothing new under the sun. What, what we're teaching, I guarantee you, has been taught before. So we're all just reusing God's, God's stuff here, right? Uh, and, and we know it's his stuff, and we're just doing our best to decipher it. But there's nothing new under the sun. Like, when it comes to, like, these profound revelations, man, everything that needs to be said has been said. Everything that can be said has been said, and, and we're just kind of... Uh, repeating it, I love when it's revelation for me and it comes alive like never before. And then you begin to research it really quick and say, well, no, hey, uh, so-and-so has said this and so-and-so has said this. So can we change our mind about what we believe when God brings us a, a better interpretation through another teacher? Do we have a teachable heart even as we strive to teach others? And in godly wisdom from above will always come with purity of spirit that removes our personal ambition and makes God's glory and his word be our focus entirely. And following from our pure motive, James says in verse 17, that we will speak in peaceable, in gentle, and a responsible way. And our speech as we teach should not be pushy, should not be arrogant, should not be entrenched, it should not be defensive, it should not be angry, it should not be confrontational. But what James says, it will be full of mercy and good fruits. So a teacher who speaks with the wisdom from above speaks from a perspective of God's mercy and grace. And the fruit of his teaching will be the ultimate measure of where his wisdom originates. And so if we first look at the life of a teacher to see if his wisdom has led to, godly, to a godly life in his own walk, right? Is the teacher the kind of man he calls others to be based on Scripture? Is his home life godly? Is it a peaceful home? Are his children respectful and obedient? And so the Bible gives us these tests because they tell us whether a man's teaching is rooted in wisdom given from above or a false wisdom that originates from a selfish, fleshly source. And, and I, I tell you, I've met with so many young up-and-coming people that, who, who aspire to teach the Bible and, and they just can't wait to get their time in the spotlight. In a lot of cases, like you know, they have strong knowledge of Scripture, um, but when, when they're seeking for recognition, they're not operating the Spirit, and they display a kind of prideful um, ambitiousness that speaks louder than their words, and it's reflected in their personal life and their personality. And when James says, look at the fruit of a teacher's ministry as a whole, Right. So James is saying we got to look at that as a whole. And, and when they when they teach our lives changed, are our men and women brought to faith, are our families in marriages, are they being restored, our hearts strengthened to serve the Lord? Or is the teacher bringing discord? Is he bringing factions? Is he bringing disputes? Right. Is he causing more harm than good? 
And so my prayer every time I get up is I'm doing my best to decipher the scriptures, to present something that can actually be applied to your life through God's word, that you can take it and run with it and become a more, uh, a more in love follower of Jesus. That's, that's what the heart is. Um, so, but then finally, James says, as a teacher operating with wisdom from above, they're going to remain unwavering in the presentation of truth. Unwavering, what does it mean? It means kind of teaching without prejudice or partiality. The teacher doesn't waver in his presentation of truth simply because his audience is different and may not like what Scripture says in some sense. Um, and I'm so thankful that I learned this lesson early on that, hey, never compromise God's word, right? It's not about tickling ears. It's about speaking truth, right? It's about speaking truth. So unwavering is different than being unteachable. I can be unwavering and yet remain teachable so long as my changing views are informed from scripture right <laughs> and nothing else and not from an external viewpoint or a trend or a fad that's going on as long as my motive remains speaking truth and not pleasing my audience or my own pride then i'm good then i'm good and what happens it takes a strong mature christian to admit that they've been wrong in understanding areas of scripture they previously felt was kind of a settled fact it also requires a, a strong, mature teacher to be able to present the honest truth in the, face of, in the face of a hostile audience, in a hostile culture, in a hostile world. Especially if the teacher looks to the audience for their financial support as a pastor, for example. right? Am I going to cater to fill seats or am I going to cater to get people rooted and grounded in God's word and, and rather see them in heaven? It's an easy, it's an easy no-brainer for me. I want to see people in heaven. So, um, a teacher can't seek to be approved by the world or or the carnal members of his audience, because if that's the road that you're walking on, you're going to waver. You are going to waver. And this big idea bridges James into the first part of chapter four, where James begins to raise concerns over how our faith is tested by our temptation to seek the world's acceptance. And so let me read verses 1 to 3 of chapter 4. It says, Where do quarrels and conflicts among you come from? Don't they come from this, uh, namely your passions, the battles within your bodily parts? You crave and have not. You murder and you envy, yet you cannot get it. You fight and you wage war. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your passions. Some translations might say your pleasures. So the members of the church, what, hap what is happening here? They're quarreling and James asks why. What's the source of the conflict? It isn't from God and it, it's, it's not proper and it's or natural. Uh, it's not a natural product of faith. The source, James says, is our flesh. Uh, uh, more specifically, our fleshly desires for worldly pleasures. And the source for quarreling is their sinful flesh, their sinful desires. And I think if we're being honest, that principle we would find to be 100% true in our own experiences, right? I've been invited to different groups, to different churches from time to time. I've been exposed to church quarrels and church fighting. And it doesn't matter where you find it, what environment you step into, you can always trace the discord to fleshly sinful desires to gain something that we think holds value in the world. It's true. James doesn't name the, spe the specific worldly pleasures these believers were seeking after, but instead he begins to describe a general pattern of worsening behavior because first james says we lust right that word lust means sinful cravings might be a craving for attention for fame for wealth for power control 
We already learned how a Jewish teacher or rabbi would likely receive all things as a result of kind of holding a teaching position. So the problem began when people lusted for earthly, worldly rewards that, are, that kind of were attached to these roles. Rather than seeking the heavenly rewards that God alone appoints to someone who desires to serve them, and this lust then leads to what James says, to murder. And in extreme cases, this is literally true. But that's not likely to be what James is actually meaning here. He's actually speaking of murder in the same way Jesus did when he said, if you harbor hatred in your heart, you have committed a sin equivalent to murder. So the lustful desire leads to a sinful thought against others who stand in the way of maybe you and I obtaining what we want. And so this is the exact kind of quarreling James alluded to back in chapter 3. He now begins to repeat it in, in verse 2 of chapter 4. And then James says that they do not have these things they, they want because they do not ask. So in the context of James's teaching here, it's clear what they wanted, at least in part, right? We can see they wanted to be in a teaching or a leadership role, or they had some ambition or desire that had developed from lust. And James says they hadn't asked, meaning they hadn't prayed to God and asked him to grant them this thing. In Greek, the verb tense is, it's a continuous action of not asking. And so they are continually not asking God, but rather they are always doing what so many of us do, taking matters into our own hands. So a desire or lust begins a series of, let's call it walking down a slippery slope into sinful thoughts, into sinful actions, all done in an effort to gain something in their own power rather than just asking God. But even when some do resort to prayer, they ask and they don't receive. Why? Because it's, well, it's really clear. It says you're asking with the wrong motives. And the, and the Greek word for wrong motives, it's actually fascinating what it means. It actually means evil. And their motive is to spend what they receive on their pleasures. And this phrase is the same phrase used to describe the prodigal son's behavior when he squandered and wasted his fortune away in foolish living. James isn't, spe isn't speaking simply of spending in the sense of spending money, but more generally of wasting God's provision on satisfying our flesh. And, and who could God expect and, and who could expect God to honor such a request if he knows we are only going to use his gift really to satisfy our evil desires? So James isn't teaching on how to pray in such a way to get what we want. And I, and, and I have to say that because in a lot of people come to these verses of James, quote them out of context, and then they use them to make, out, uh, make up a point of how we are to pray if we are to receive what we want. There's a mini lesson to be found here on the issue of prayer. Um, it is only the one James, if there is a lesson, it's only the one that James is offering here himself. It is that when we ask for something with an evil desire or a motive, what can we do? We can expect God to say no, yet. That's all we conclude that's all that we can conclude about prayer from these verses. We can't take that truth and turn it backwards in an attempt to create a second principle. Just really, we can't say that when, when we ask with a sincere motive that we are guaranteed that God is going to give us what we want. You've probably figured out in your faith, if you've been at it for any time, that it doesn't work that way. We still might not get what we ask for, even if we ask with perfect motives. And what happens is false teachers try to use this verse to explain why we don't get what we want when we pray. Well, hey, maybe you must not have asked with enough faith or the right motives. Instead of moving into kind of 
this this thing on prayer, James is interested in addressing the the much larger problem in the church, seeking after worldly desires. Because the next two verses, man, they're 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 intense, and let's read them. Uh, you adulteresses, don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that in vain the scripture says, he who yearns jealousy over the spirit which has made to dwell in us? Man, that is an intense portion of scripture. So what is, what is James doing here? He, he draws his lesson from an Old Testament principle that what? That God is a jealous God. And, and we are either friends with God or we are friends with the world. We can't seek after what the world values while at the same time leading a life that pre- pleases the Lord. Why? Because they're mutually incompatible. Right? It doesn't happen. And that word world there is the Greek word cosmos, and it means the world system, the way the world does things. And so it's almost like we, we, we want the best of what the world has to offer and we grab hold hands with the world and we want the best of what God has to offer and we grab hold of God and we're thinking, hey, I'm going to live in this place and God says, no, no, you're committing adultery. You adulterers, don't you know that friendship with the world system, the way the world does things, that's enmity between God. You are committing adultery. Um, and, and the principle of the Old Testament, as is described in Israel's disobedience of God's commandments, is what? Israel is committing adultery. It, they were doing it. And now James says the individual believers, we are repeating the mistake, saying that we're cheating on God in pursuing worldly lusts and behaviors. And, and I think James sums it up best. Whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And you think, how sad it is that James's counsel to the first century church is still so relevant and real for you and I today. And how many churches, how many people are in turmoil because they're repeating the same errors again and again and again. I, I, I think it's, it's, it's crazy. And so my prayer is that you will take verses 4 and 5 to heart. Man, and you begin to examine your own life. And, and I know that I do that for, for my life in, in getting up here and in, in teaching and in doing that. And, and I, I carry the weight of it, and I know the weight of it. And I want to make sure I'm doing it with pure motives every single time, every single time. I know this world has nothing to offer me, nothing to offer me, but it's still easy to get caught up in, in oh, if I only had discomfort or if I only had this pleasure right? So easily we can get up, but I don't want anything the world has to offer. I don't want to be a friend of the world to be an enemy of God. I want to be fully committed and surrendered to Jesus. And that's what James is talking about here. There is a full submission and surrender. Let go of the hand of the world. Stop committing spiritual adultery and fix and focus your eyes, your whole being to worship God, to love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Right to pursue him first in everything you do. So, Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for how amazing it is, for how incredible it is. God, we embrace it, and we continue to say yes to it. Thank you for the lessons that, that we're learning here in the book of James that are still so relevant for us today. Forgive us for committing spiritual adultery and, and for seeking at times the pleasures of this world over what you have to offer. God, we realize everything this world has to offer is fleeting and fading. And we rest in you and we stand in the truth of who you are. And we're thankful for your love and for your mercy and your grace. Lord, would you continue to let your word come alive in our hearts. In your wonderful name. And everybody said, amen. Well, bless you guys. Just a reminder, Monday, the 29th of April, we are doing our Israel Information Night. We'd love to have you come out and join us. No commitment necessary, right? Nothing wrong with just listening. But you can hear about the trip. Ask any questions that you have about the trip. 
Uh, we'll unpack it in a way to give you a better understanding of where we're going, hotels we're staying at, pictures, photos of all of that places we're going to be visiting, safety and how safe it is when you're actually there. So hopefully we'll see you there. Uh, if not, hopefully we'll see you tomorrow morning. Devotion, if not, tomorrow night at church. Bless you guys. Bye for now.